so let's just uh, check and see uh, the answers. So, uh, Davidenko, Ksenia, can you tell us about the first one? Uh, so, present value means that uh, the talking about the time value of money. Yes, we were talking about the apple today and the future, year. Yes, so the question is why is the present value higher than the future value? Uh, uh, it's uh, because uh, of many reasons such as uh, that we prefer to uh, well, eat an apple now than in the, uh, okay. in the year. Right, right. Also, yeah, uh, we need to have some patience to wait for. Okay, so that's the same one, right? I, some people are more patient, some people aren't. Uh, right. So it's also inflation. Yes. Uh, and that's uncertainty. Uncertainty. Uncertainty or risk, right? Depends on the assets. Okay. Uh, then, Kisenia Astafet, what is the real interest rate? Uh, real uh, interest rate. Um, firstly, it's um, it's a nominal interest minus expected inflation. Okay. Uh, so, so nominal minus inflation is the equation, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the interest uh, like for our patients. Okay. So basically, it's this, right? patients or preference, what people prefer to consume today than in the future. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next one, risk, you, you, nam, you, runa. am I pronouncing the name correctly? The Korean name, you, you, nam, liu, run, nam, in Chinese name, not here. Uh, hong, hui, yeah. hu, yes. What about risk? How can we know about the risk? For example, when we're buying bonds, where can we find the information about the risk? about the risk for bonds. Yes. Yes, where can we find that information? Their bond is going to be including inflation. So if we take away inflation, then we get an idea of the risk, right? But there's another place we can find the information. Where else can we find the information? We can find Bloomberg. Bloomberg. So the credit rating agency, their job is to tell us about the risk on bonds. Okay? So the credit rating agency will tell us the risk for bonds, for lending money. Just the general rule about risk, if we have higher risk, we can get higher return, right? Lower risk, lower return. So we can't, if, idea in finance, you can't get a high return with low risk, okay? Uh, diversification, E, G, SU, what does that mean? What is diversification? <coughs> we studied in the last class. Uh, EJ Hong. Yes, what is diversification? More is going to More is going to I 
I buy bonds, some bonds. Mm -hmm. Maybe I divide my money to several stocks. Yes. Why is it safer to divide your money if, among several companies? If there are two stocks, like A and B. Yes. When I buy two both of them, mm -hmm. if A says price goes down, price goes down but B goes up, mm -hmm. I can de uh, decrease my risk. Okay, Do you, can you also decrease your return? <coughs> you decrease your risk, but do you also decrease your return? Using diversification. Lower risk, does that mean lower return? We just discussed about risk and return. Does lower risk mean lower return? Hmm? So you think you can make low risk and high return? No. Is that possible? No. Hmm? Yeah. Low, risk low, return. low risk is going to be lower return. Okay? You do diversification, you have lower risk, but it works the same on the upside. You're also going to get a lower return. Okay? Maybe the stock B could go up a lot. But the stock A didn't go up a lot, so you didn't make as much profit. If you just invested in stock B, you would have made a big profit. Okay? Because you invest in stock A, it's more stable. So not as much return. So then, a Yang Hong sucks. And what about herding? What is herding? Herding is a psychological issue in the markets. Way, John. Yes, what is hurting? <laughs> Can you explain in Korean? market. Everybody is thinking and acting in the same way. They're not acting rationally. They're just following each other. What can that cause? What's this? Hmm? Bubble. <laughs> can cause a bubble, right? How do you say bubble in Korean? Or something like that? Yes. Huh? Yeah. Or it can also cause the crash. And then the last one, uh, E on G. What is marginal utility? Where is E on G? Not here. Um, moon K1. What is marginal utility? Please. <coughs> okay, so the consumer prefers something, they have more money. Okay, there's a also related to supply and demand. So we saw the example of water and diamonds. So then uh, let's move on today to talk about uh, macroeconomics, the main ideas of macroeconomics. So we're using this document, uh, which is in the readings. Okay, so this is 
this I use some documents from the Harvard Business Publishing because they're quite clearly written, it's more clearly written, but also has good information. But I find they write it more clearly than other books. So if you want in your own time, you can read this uh, document. It has a few pages on the readings. And here we have also, this document has some glossary of terms related to economics. But also during the course, for example, we'll study about balance of payments, or here's bubble, a steep increase in asset prices. Okay? So you cannot, if you like, if you want, this is useful to study <coughs> this, this glossary of terms. Business cycle, we'll study about the business cycle during the course. Okay? Central banks, we're going to talk about today. A central bank is an institution that controls a nation's monetary policy. Monetary policy. Central bank in the U.S. is called the Federal Reserve, okay, for example. So, then let's begin to discuss about macroeconomics. So we're going to just have an overview of macroeconomics, because just like the financial theory, understanding about, maybe you already studied about macroeconomics before, right? But we need to understand about that. So there are three main ideas. There is output, money and expectations, and they all have a relationship between them. So if we look at the document, we have a graph on the document which shows here is money, here is expectations, and here is output. Output we measure with GDP, money we're talking about inflation, interest rate, exchange rate. Expectations we're talking about animal spirits like herding. Herding is animal spirit. Right? Do you understand animal spirits? Yes. It's called that way because people are not acting intelligently or rationally. They're acting like animals, right? So, irrational exuberance, people, irrational. We talk about rational here, irrational. Exuberance means doing, going too much or doing too much, right? People's expectations, what do they expect? So, we're talking about the relationship between expectations and money, and output, okay. GDP. So, <clears throat> the reason we look at macroeconomics, it's just a theory, it doesn't always work in real life. We just want to make a baseline to look at reality. And it's a framework for understanding economic events. So this is a framework, okay, when you build a tent, you make the frame, and then you put the tent over the frame. Okay? So this is a framework, it's basic, which helps us to build on top of it okay? later. So we have some principles and relationships, and these help us to shed light, understand a broad range of things, many of which help to shape or change the business environment, and it affects the risks and the rewards of decisions that we make in our everyday life. So let's start with output. So output is the goods and services produced in an economy. So goods, can you give me an example of goods? Car, service, cell phone is good, service, tourism, right? Staying a night in a hotel, you can't see, you can't keep a service, right? It's just a one-time experience. I stayed in the hotel last night. If I stay again tomorrow, it might be a little bit different, right? So service is just a one-time thing that not we can't reproduce and we can't <coughs> touch. Can I touch a one-night stay in a hotel? No, that's a service, right? Can I touch a car? Yes. Yes, it's good. So we put all the goods and services together, we add them up, this is output. This is what every economy is interested in, increasing their output, increasing the amount of goods and services they produce. So for example, uh, 50 years ago, women started to enter the workforce a lot more. 
So countries, goods and services went up, <coughs> right? In, they were producing more goods and more services. So it determines a country's level of prosperity. <coughs> so some people think it's not correct to measure how well a country is doing by GDP. These days we have World Happiness Index, right? Or other index, Economic Development Index, which also measures health, education, and so on. Okay? So for example, a country like Saudi Arabia has very high GDP. What does Saudi Arabia produce a lot of? Oil. Oil. So its output is very high. <coughs> Why? They produce 80% of Saudi Arabia's exports is oil. Okay? The next 10% is some industry related to oil. Okay? Then the last 10% is other things. So 90, more than 90% of Saudi Arabia's exports is oil. Saudi Arabia's economy has not modernized. They still have a king. They don't have a democratic government. Most other countries got rid of kings 200 years ago. But Saudi Arabia didn't need to because they were so wealthy. They had so much oil. The king just gives money to all the people. Right? So the people just, a lot of the Saudi Arabian people, they don't have to work. They just get money from the king. But the country is not modernized or developed, so they don't have a good health care and they don't have good education, right? System. So can we use GDP just to say that countries are doing a good job or not? No. What do you think? No. Right? So these days it's getting more popular not only using GDP, right? But also using. You can check the Human Development Index. Okay, that's another way created by the UN to check how the countries are doing. So, for example, Korea is higher than Saudi Arabia on the Human Development Index because Korea's education and health is quite high. So, Korea scores highly on Human Development Index. Okay, even if its GDP is not as high as other countries. Usually the top scoring countries here is Sweden or Norway. They have high GDP and also good education and health system. But for economists, GDP, how much output you're producing, they think this is important to say how well countries are doing. Okay? So a lot of output, country is doing very well. Low output, country is not doing well. Okay? We need to change something. How do we measure this? Gross domestic product. GDP is the total value of all the goods and services produced in a country in a given year. So that's an important number because we often <coughs> compare things to GDP. Okay? How much money do I need to give to the IMF? Is that going to be based on my population or my GDP? GDP, right? If it was based on population, then India and China would have to give a lot of money to the IMF, right? Whereas the wealthy countries wouldn't have to give a lot of money to the IMF. So GDP is used very often to decide things, right? Looking at percentage, different percentages compared to the GDP. <coughs> Which countries have the highest GDP in the world? Yes, which country is number two? China. Number three? Japan. Number four? Japan. Germany, okay. Number five? France. Maybe the UK or France, right? Uh, so next we have money. Do you have any questions about output? This is our aim. We want to get high output. Okay. So Money is just used for facilitating the exchange of goods and services. Okay, so can you eat money? No? You can't? If you're on a desert island with nobody there, you're starving, do you prefer one million dollars or a coconut? Coconut, right? So money is just used for, for exchanging goods and services helping us to exchange goods and services. <laughs> it influences interest rates, exchange rates, and inflation. So we can do this by increasing or decreasing the money supply. So 
if we think about money supply in a simple way, just I give you one unit of money each, right? Then I print more money, I give you another unit of money. Okay, what's going to happen to prices? Product price. Oh, yes. Why? Because our money is too lower. Yes. Money in the classroom is more, right? So you can afford to pay more for things, right? You're competing against each other. So inflation will increase. What about your exchange rate? If we have another classroom there, and they still have one unit, and you guys have two units, what's the exchange rate going to be? Yes, there will be one, and you will be two. Ratio will be one is to two, right? But if you guys only have one, the ratio will be one to one. Okay? So when you have more money, what happens to your exchange rate? Get stronger or weaker? The exchange rate is going to get weaker. Okay, so an increase in money supply decreases interest rates, causes the exchange rate to depreciate, and increases inflation. So we have nominal and real values for money. Nominal values are measured in current market prices. Real values are measured in terms of constant prices minus inflation. So we already looked at the interest rate. Nominal minus inflation equals real. Okay? So the same for the money <coughs> at the end of the year. Nominal GDP minus inflation equals real GDP growth. Okay, so for example, last year Venezuela's GDP grew by 20% in the Venezuelan money. Is that a lot of growth? The answer is it depends on inflation in Venezuela, right? What if inflation in Venezuela was 40%? Was that good GDP growth? No. No, it's going to be minus 20, the real one. Okay? So we have to think about inflation. So uh, <coughs> economists care about real GDP. Okay? So if we get a 5% increase in real GDP, it means that output increased by 5%. Okay? That's the important number. So just to explain a little bit about inflation, uh, we can read, there's a story in the reading. There's Bill and Tom, two guys. Okay? Bill has got uh, 10 cows. Okay? He sells 10 cows to Tom. Tom pays him $1,000. Then uh, the interest rate, it's a little bit strange, but the interest rate is going to be 10%. Okay? So let's say that the inflation is 10%. Okay? Now, the next year, Tom is going to sell back, or he's going, Bill is going to buy back the cows from Tom. Okay? Mm, Tom gave him, let's say Tom gave him a thousand dollars, right? So, well, let's say there's no interest just first. He didn't get any interest, okay? And the inflation was ten uh, percent, okay? So, how much is ten cows? If inflation is ten percent, how much is ten cows worth next year? One thousand one hundred. So, Bill has a thousand dollars, right? He got a thousand dollars from Tom. Can he buy back all the cows? No. no. How many cows can he buy? Nine. Nine. Nine cows. So, next year, he's going to have a thousand dollars, right? But a thousand dollars is not going to buy ten cows. Inflation was ten percent. So, he can just get back nine cows. Okay, so, we can understand here the problem with inflation. Okay, so we, we can use this story for Japan and the US, or China and the US, okay? So Japan sells goods to the US, right? Cars, a lot of cars, right? Toyotas. 
it costs a million dollars. Then the next year, Japan gets a million US dollars, right? Yeah. Japan wants to use their dollars <coughs> to buy the goods from the US. But we had a 10% inflation. So, can Japan get the same number of cars back or less cars back? Yes. So, they're going to get less cars for their $1 million. Was that a good deal for Japan? No. Okay? So, do I want to lend things to countries that have high inflation? No. Do I want to own the bond of a country which has a high inflation? Sell things to them and get their money? No, right? So this is the risk. A lot of Asian countries like Japan and China, Korea, own a lot of US dollars. They sold things to the US, right? And they got US dollars. So what's the, what do they want not to happen? They don't want the dollar's value to decrease, right? They don't want high inflation in the US. If there is a high inflation in the US, their dollars are going to be worth less, and it's like a bad deal for them. They sold all this stuff to the US, they got the dollars at this price, then there was a high inflation, now they want to use their dollars to buy goods, but dollars are not worth as much, so they get less goods. Can you understand that idea? So this is the problem with inflation. Interestingly, in the Roman times, uh, the Roman, here was, do you know Rome? Roman yes. Empire? Yes. In Europe? Right? Everybody here was using Roman coins. So the Romans were printing the coins. And then here's the East. Today, we also have the East, like Turkey, right? And Middle East. They would sell grain to Rome. Right? You understand grain? Yes. The Romans would pay them with their Roman coins. Okay? Then they got the Roman coins. Then what did the Romans do? The Romans minted a lot of new coins. Made a lot of new coins in Rome. Were these people happy? No. 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 Romans were always doing that. Every 50 years or so, the Romans would change their currency completely because their old currency would get so worthless after 50 years of inflation, right? So these people were getting a little bit of a bad deal, right? Because the inflation in Rome was so high. Eventually they would stop accepting the Roman coins, and then Rome would have to make a new monetary system. They'd have to make new coins, okay? So, <coughs> uh, they, Rome always had a problem with inflation. So, these days, countries keep, try to keep inflation low. One of the jobs of the central bank is to keep the inflation low. So inflation in the US, they're trying to keep at below 2%. In Europe, below 2%. Okay. <coughs> so the central bank tries to influence the money supply. Its main tools are the discount rate, uh, the reserve requirement and open market operations. Okay. Buying and selling government bonds on the open market. Their main idea of the central bank is two things. In the US, they want to target inflation and also they want to support employment. Support employment. But Europe is a little bit different. In Europe, they just want to target inflation. They're not as worried about supporting employment. Okay? So recently there was a problem with unemployment in the US. So the central bank made some policy because of the unemployment. Okay? They're, what do you think they're going to do? Increase or decrease the money supply? If we have a lot of unemployment, should we increase or decrease money in the economy? Increase. Right, so they, because of the unemployment, they increased the money supply. So right now, the, they did increase the money supply, decrease the interest rate. Okay, right now in the US, unemployment is okay. It's down to 5.1%. Okay? 
before unemployment was up near 10%. Okay? It's come down to 5.1% since the central bank did these policies. So we're going to talk about that. <coughs> so open market operations. Do you understand open? <coughs> in the uh, markets, right? Just in the markets that everybody uses. Yeah. Operation means working or doing, doing something in the open market. This is the main tool used by the Federal Reserve. What is the Federal Reserve? Central Bank, Central Bank where? US. US, right? What's it called short way? Federal Reserve is very long. What do people say short way? The Fed, they call it the Fed. So if you watch the business news, nobody is going to say the Central Bank of the United States too long. They're not even going to say the Federal Reserve. They might say that, but that's also long. So everybody just says the Fed. They're talking about the Central Bank in the US. Okay? So what they do with this open market operations is they try to make uh, condition in the federal funds market so they want to make change the interest rate uh, in the federal fund market so let's just have a look at this link so we can understand a little bit better about how central banks work yeah. so just for homework you should check the home page of your central bank and find out what does the central bank do. I'll ask you in the next class. Okay? <coughs> what does a central bank do? So just look at the homepage of your own central bank in your own language. Okay? And read about what the central bank does. Does anybody want to work for the central bank one day? Maybe. Okay, so here we can say monetary policy. This is the main job of the central bank. Okay, first it's about the Fed, next news, then monetary policy. So <coughs> monetary policy is controlling the money supply. <coughs> Increasing the money supply, decreasing the money supply. Okay? Banking information and regulation, that's the next most important thing they do. Okay? Payment systems, economic research and data. Most of the workers are going to be here in regulation and research and data. Monetary, they will then give the data to the Monetary Policy Committee. It's a committee, do you understand committee? Yeah. Like group of people. And the head of the committee is called the chairperson. Currently, it's Janet Yellen, so it's the first woman to do that job, right? Her name is Janet Yellen. She is the important person, chairperson of the Federal Reserve. Okay, so they have this committee. And then what, how do they try to control the money supply? So they do this, open market operations. So you can find this link and read yourself, right? To the purchase and sale of securities in the open market. What does securities mean? Bonds, Bonds or stocks or any financial asset, right? Mainly we're talking about bonds. So, uh, they are conducted by the trading desk. So the Federal Reserve Bank in New York has a trading desk and they trade, they buy and sell these assets to control the money supply. So here we're going to see like examples. <coughs> they had some large scale asset purchase programs. So in 2008, 2000, they had a financial crisis. Yes. So they established yeah. a near zero target range for the federal funds rate. So this is really an interest rate in the US, okay? Yeah. They wanted to have a zero interest rate. Why? Because they have an unemployment problem. So they want to decrease the interest rate. So just let's talk about that. How does that help unemployment? If we decrease the interest rate, increase the money supply, 
How is that going to help unemployment? That's what the central bank wanted. We're going to talk about how they did that, but first, why? Why, if we increase, decrease the interest rate, why does that help unemployment? Many people start a new business. They yes. lend the money to bank. Okay, so to start a new business, you need to get a loan, right? Unless you're very rich. Okay, even if you're very rich, it's still a good idea to use some debt, right? Uh, start a new business, you have to get a loan. Okay, if a loan is 10%, or loan is 1%, which is more likely to start a business? 1%, right? Another reason why a low interest rate might help unemployment? Liquidity. Liquidity. Yeah. Right? More money in the economy? Yes. Yes? So, yes? Uh, so, it's easy to take a loan, so yes. people will uh, make some business and create new places. Yes, so we said this, start a new business, right? Yeah, and it will create the new places for people who want to Yes, so hopefully they will create new jobs, yes. So another reason, you said liquidity, more money in the economy. Another reason people might think of in Korea, because of maybe cultural difference. In the US, a lot of people have 20 or 30 year mortgages. Do you understand mortgage? Yes. They also have a very on the flexible rate. Right? So if the money, if the interest rate goes down for the banks, the private banks, they have to pass on this advantage to their customers. Okay? So your credit card's interest rate and also your mortgage interest rate is linked to this interest rate. Okay? So this is the interest rate that the banks need to pay to lend the money, okay? which they are decreasing, federal funds rate. Okay? So if the bank can lend the money cheaper, then your mortgage rate is going to go down, right? Because you bought a flexible product. The flexible product means if this rate changes, your mortgage changes. Yeah. So is that good news for people or bad news <coughs> if their mortgage payment is lower every month? Yes. Good news, right? Or even if you have chance in Korea, you might also get the flexible payment. Do you understand flexible? Yes. How do you say in Korean flexible rate? Yes. You don't sound gumli, right? Young don gumli. Young don gumli. So flexible, you get the flexible rate loan. It changes with the interest rate. So people have more money. If people have more money at the end of the month, what are they going to do with it? Invest. Invest where? Prominent business in the future. Right. Anyway, they're going to use the money probably. Some people might save the money, uh, then it will go into the bank and the bank can use to invest <coughs> in business or the economy, right? Some people will buy things with their extra money. They might get another hair, more expensive haircut. The hairdresser has to hire more people. Yes. They're getting their hair cut more often. Okay? Or they start to buy a new car. So the car factory can hire more people. Okay? So these are the main ways in which decreasing the interest rate can help unemployment. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Increase it. So we are going to increase the money supply, decrease the interest rate, help unemployment. Okay? We're not going to worry about inflation at the moment because we, we're in a crisis. Okay? So let's see what the Federal Reserve did. It expanded its holding of long-term securities via a series of asset purchase programs with the goal of putting downward pressure on long-term interest rates. So this is a, we could say this in simpler English, but I think you need to see this way because later, if you watch the business news, they're going to talk like that, okay? So they often talk about this downward pressure. Do you understand downward pressure? Yes. Yes, pushing down. So we want to put downward pressure on long-term interest rates, make them go down. How? Buying long-term securities through asset purchase programs. <coughs> okay, so again, we, there is something we need to explain here, which is how does buying the US government bonds reduce the interest rate? So the last class we talked about the US government bond. Right? So let's say that 
the US government bond was nine, nine million <coughs> now, cost nine million, okay? After 10 years, it's 10 million. Okay, let's just say, we're not going to do the calculation, let's just say the yield is 4%, okay? So we pay 9 million now, we get 10 million in 10 years, okay? Yield is 4% a year, so we're making profit, right? How much profit are we making? About 4% a year, just for example, okay? So, if I, what I want is I want this number to go down. In order to make this number go down, what do I need to do? <coughs> Which number needs to get higher here for this number to go down? This number needs to get higher or this number needs to get higher? The left one, right? So if this goes up to 9.5 million, is my yield going to be higher or lower? Right? Let's say it goes to 9.5, my yield is going to be, let's say, 2.5 percent, right? So, how can I make this number higher? We have to understand how these bonds are sold. Bonds are sold at the auction, okay? And also in the secondary market, as we talked about the last time, anybody can buy these bonds, okay? So, what's the US Central Bank going to do? They're going to buy buy these bonds. What's going to happen to the price? If demand increases, what's going to happen to this price? It goes up. It goes up. If this price goes up, what's going to happen to the yield? It goes down. Okay? So, the number one holder of US government bonds is the Federal Reserve. They own about 30% of the US debt. Okay? Other countries can't do this much because of the inflation problem. The US can do that. Okay, so that's one thing they're going to do is buy their own bonds. So where can we see here? So from March 2009 to October 2009, the Federal Reserve purchased 300 billion. That's a lot of money, right? 300 billion dollars. Do you understand billion? Yes. Of long term, so long term, 10 years or more. Okay. Uh, they also have 20-year and 30-year bonds. Treasury securities. Treasury, we're talking about the US government bond when we say treasury. It's like the Fed. US government bond is very long, okay? So we can say treasury, it's shorter, okay? So again, if you listen to the business news, they might say US government bond, but they'll probably say treasuries, right? So you need to learn that kind of vocabulary. So they bought their own treasury securities, their government bonds, to help improve the conditions, right? From November to June, they also bought <coughs> another 600 billion of long-term treasury securities. So they come in and they want to buy 600 billion. Of course this price is going to go up. It's going to go up to 9.9, .9, right? The yield is going to be 0.25%, right? 9.98. So this is their target. They want to get this. They established a near zero target. Okay? They want to get the target down to zero. So then the question is, how much do I need to buy? Okay? The investors, when the US had a crisis, investors didn't want to buy. Okay? So the price was going down, and the US was having a problem. The government has to pay a high yield for the money. Banks have to pay a high yield for the money. The bank wants to let, lend the money, right? Investors are going to lend to the bank at 5%. So how about the US central bank comes in, buy, starts buying all of these things, and pushes down the yield to almost 0%. Okay? Why? We want to increase unemployment, decrease unemployment. So all the things they did, they also bought 175 billion of these companies, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they are mortgage companies. Do you understand mortgage? Yes. So the idea here is uh, people can't pay back their mortgage to the banks, okay? So these banks are going to have big problems. They can't give loans to people, okay? So the central bank is going to come in and buy these these uh, mortgages from the banks. 
Okay, and the central bank is going to take the loss instead of the bank. So that's what they're doing here. Okay? Do you understand that idea? If you can't pay back your mortgages and I'm the bank, can I lend money to a new business? No, I have finance I'm called a zombie bank. Do you understand zombie? Yes. I'm just collecting money from you very slowly and I can't lend to anybody else. So the central bank comes in, it says, give me all the debt, and I'll give you cash. What do I say? Thank you very much, or no? They say, give me all those people's debt, sell it to me, and I'll give you the face value of the cash. Am I going to say yes or no? Yes. Yes, yes of course. I don't think you guys can pay me back. I'm getting the full value from the central bank, right? So I say, yes, thank you very much, central bank. 